From the Columbia University Language Resource Center, this is Said and Done, the podcast about languages and the people who speak them. This is Said and Done. I'm Chris Kaiser, and joining me today is Mariam C., professor of Wolof and Polar languages at Columbia University. In this interview, we'll discuss growing up speaking Polar, Wolof, and French in multilingual Senegal. She'll describe how she got interested in linguistics and eventually became a teacher of Wolof at Columbia. We'll then go into detail about how she teaches Wolof and how she views this teaching as what she calls a decolonial enterprise. She discusses how she identifies specific concepts within Wolof culture and helps students to build a detailed understanding of those concepts over the course of several years. Here's my interview with Professor Mariam C. So Mariam, thank you so much for joining us today. Just to start, you are a lecturer at Columbia and you teach Wolof, is that right? Yes. And where is that language spoken? Who speaks it? Tell us a little bit about, about Wolof. Wolof is spoken in Senegal, Gambia. Uh, there's also a sizable minority in uh, Mauritania, but there are also uh, sizable communities around the world, here in America, uh, in France, Italy, etc. But the, the, the main countries in which it is spoken is Senegal, Gambia, and Mauritania. You teach Wolof, and I guess that's your background. That's the language that you spoke growing up. But there are other languages that you spoke growing up as well. So can you kind of take us through the linguistic situation that you encountered as you were growing up, the languages that you spoke and that you learned, and kind of how they all fit together? I would say the first language that I spoke is Wolof, although I am not ethnically Wolof. Oh, okay. Both of my parents are Pular. So... But Wolof is a vehicular language, so it is spoken as a first or second language by the majority of the population in Senegal. And Pula was spoken in our household, but my parents did not speak Pula to me. My grandmother spoke Pula. Okay. So this this is kind of the multilingual context in which I grew up in. But Senegal as a whole is just a multilingual country. You can hardly find a person who only speaks one language. But, um, yeah, so the, the, so I had spoken well of growing up, but in fact, this is not the first language I heard as a child. The first language that I heard and tried to pronounce my first words in were uh, was Arabic. But when we went back to Senegal then, my when I started, you know, speaking more, I, the language I produced was Wolof. Really. Sure. I don't think I ever produced anything substantial in Arabic, but um, I think I did have some sort of language at that point because, you know, at three you have something. <laughs> For those who might not know, can you talk a little bit about Pular, sort of how that relates to Wolof? So then with Pular, of course, it was in the household. And the situation in the household is that we would get monolingual Pular speakers coming from, you know, uh, villages. They're coming into the city for various reasons, but they will stay in our house. So when these people were there, actually Pular overtook Mm. the context. I see. Of course, because my parents spoke it too. So, and there's a lot of people around who speak it. So you will hear more Pular actually than Wolof. So I, 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 up until I was about 10, 11, I think, 10, 11, for some reason, I really wanted to connect more with these people. I wanted to be able to talk to them. And so I told my grandmother, you speak full life to me sometimes, but not all the time. Mm. But now I want our communication to be in Pular. At that point, I could say certain things, but I was not fluent. Right. Um, so... She was obviously, she was so happy about that (laughs) that she started crying. Oh, wow. (laughs) Yes. And I said, why are you crying? And she said, well, I I, I am just happy that you recognize that this is your language. This is your culture. And for you, a child this age, to come to me and tell me you really want to know this language, it just brings me happiness. So, um yeah, so so then she started speaking to me in Pular only. 
And so you would speak with her in Pular, but you would speak with your parents in Wolof. Mm-hmm. And your Mostly, par- or French. Uh, or French, yeah. okay. Mm-hmm. And then your parents, when they spoke with your grandmother, what language did they use? Either. Okay. Sometimes it, it's Wolof, sometimes it's Pular. <laughs> okay. And so for you, speaking Pular and speaking Wolof together, switching between these two based on who you were speaking with, mm-hmm. how, how are these two languages different for you? What... What does one represent to you and what does the other represent to you? Pular is very much linked to my culture. It touches my cultural core. Okay. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm very close to one of two, but it is not my culture. It's not my cultural language, right? With Pular, I have a complete symbiosis between my language and my culture. With one of this, you know, I, I'm I'm actually more native in Wolof, I would say. Okay. Yeah. But it's not as close to your heart. But as it's not as is. close to, to my heart, yeah. So how how would you describe Wolof then? Is it is it a little bit more of a transactional language or a, a language that you accomplish certain tasks in? Well, I think it's a vehicular language for okay. me. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So what, what, do, what does that mean to you? It, it means I'm in a community where Wolof is the dominant language, right? So this language allows me to communicate with everyone around me, without exception. And it is also the language that I had the opportunity to teach. I did not teach Pular at all until I came to Colombia. Okay. Right? So, and for for years I had, what, six, seven years of teaching Wolof at that point. And I think um, also learning to read and write Wolof Teaching it, creating materials in it, also developed a different kind of relationship that I didn't have with Pular at that time. Looking at it as an intellectual language, sure. or yeah, but I I started doing that with Wolof. Now you mentioned that you also spoke French, mm-hmm. and so what are the context in which you would speak French? How did you learn it? Was it spoken in your household? Did you learn it in school? How, how does French come into the mix? Well, it was spoken in my household, so it was one of the languages I heard also growing up. But, um, I mean, uh, in Senegal, uh, French is the official language. It's the language of administration. It's the language of education. And um, so I started functioning with it to a larger extent when I Started kindergarten. Okay. Right. Yeah. So, and I went to Catholic school, and which um, was run by French nuns. I was taught by French nuns. So there was absolutely no speaking Wolof in this in the in school. It was forbidden. It was or? forbidden. Okay. It was forbidden, and so you know, going from there, it kind of also slipped into the household where. You tend to speak French more oh, really? than than you. So it does. Um, I mean, it just becomes a habit. You sort of spend your whole day in school, um, and then sometimes it's hard when you come home to disconnect a little bit. Uh, you might continue for some time, just responding to people in French or whatever, until you know you get you switch it back. So when you, I don't know if you can remember, if you can cast your mind back to this, but looking back, when you first went to school, Mm -hmm. how was it communicated to you that you were not going to speak Wolof and that you had to speak French? And if you spoke Wolof, there would perhaps be negative consequences for that. Oh. And what did you think when when you found that out? Well, I mean, I was was socialized to do that. Because at four, if you're being taught, you know, I mean, there was nothing harsh about it. But if you started to speak Wolof, they would say, shh, shh, parle français. That. And you're four. I mean, right, you, you know, accept you, it. you accept it. You kind of get into that. And you say to yourself also, this is school. This is the language I speak in school, right? Mm-hmm. I'm, more, I'm freer to use another language in my household. But here, it, it's French that is used. So by the time... and I, all the way through junior high and done, I was in that school. Right. So I was, yeah. So as you were growing up, as you were in junior high and high school, did you think in French or did you do things in French? Did you see yourself as 
French or was it, did you feel the opposite of that? You know, what, what role did it play and how did it interact with, with your use of Pular and Wolof? Um, that is the thing. I don't think I ever saw myself as French. Uh, because actually in that school, there was a majority of French and Lebanese students and I saw myself distinct from them. We had this common language. I, I had very good friends among them. We grew up being friends. But um, I never thought of myself as a French person. But it, it was very apparent that French was in the, the, the Senegalese context itself, not speaking about the, the Lebanese who use the French language or the French in Senegal who, who, who use this language. I think there was sort of a tear that, that was in place. And people like me uh-huh. who, were, who were in this context, you know, um, being forced to speak French all the time, being taught by French nuns, was seen as people who are Frenchy. Okay, you know? sure. So, um, yeah, I heard many comments about, you know, my language being different the way I speak French or, you know, um, sometimes throwing words at, uh, at me because one thing happened, my R's were French completely, even when I spoke well. Okay. So I had to actually work later on to um, to correct myself, to, to do the R when I'm speaking in Wolof, Wolof and yeah. not R. Right. right, so the two different ways of, yeah. of pronouncing R. Yeah, I remember one time, you know, sending my little cousin to buy me peanuts and I say, and the people who were sitting around just burst out laughing. <laughs> And for the <laughs> for the next two days, I heard when I pass them in the house, they say "gaste," <laughs> and then <laughs> oh my and it, it kept and and I was annoyed in the end. Yeah, yeah. Um, those kind of things, right? So, but, yeah, it seems like these languages are not the the boundaries between them are not super rigid. No, they can kind of influence one and the other. Mm-hmm. How did you go from um, being in this multilingual context and encountering these different languages and and having them mean different, you know, using them means different things to different people and the people that you would interact with. So how did you pass from that to wanting to study Wolof in an academic context to thinking that you might want to teach it as well? What's the what's the bridge from from that childhood and adolescent context into the professional context and the way that you have Wolof as part of your professional profile mission? I think up to the time that I finished my BA in Senegal, I think I had no notion of language dominance, no notion of French being the intellectual language in the context that I grew up in. And I never thought about the fact that I was literate in French, in English, in Spanish, and I was not literate in my own languages. I could speak them, but I could neither read or write them. So um, when I started graduate school, and actually this, this was in the course of me applying, I was still thinking about going to comparative lit. But when I was applying, a friend of mine who was teaching Wolof at UCLA decided she was going to change jobs and she she went into the LA school system. And she told me that I am going to put you in touch with this professor in the linguistics department because they're looking for a graduate student to teach um, Wolof. Mm. Um, I said, oh, cannot teach Wolof. I can't read it or write it. She said, oh, you'll be able to teach yourself that because I did that. So it's, it's not as hard. Um, so, so she put me in touch with um, Professor Russell Shu, And I, um, 
made an appointment and went to see him. And he said, so I heard that you're applying at UCLA. And which which department are you are you thinking of going? I said comparative work, and then he said, "Why do you want to go?" Actually, I want to do that because I have a BA <laughs> in English and um, American Lit, and I don't really know what else to do in, in graduate studies but that. But to tell you the truth, you know, I'm not eager to continue this because even before I finished my BA I kind of really got bored with literature and he said why did you get bored with literature I said well because I don't I don't want to read what people write and analyze it what I really want to understand about language is actually how are they able to manipulate language and do the things that they're doing so he said okay so let me give you something. So he got up and picked up a book and gave it to me and said, well, read this. If you find interest in this, then I urge you to apply to the linguistics department. And what was the book? The Language Instinct. Oh, okay. I remember it. So That's uh, Steven Pinker? Steven Pinker. Right. So I went home <laughs> with the book, and I'm reading this, and I could couldn't put the put the book down. I think I read all night, you know, and and almost read most of the book that day. Uh, so I I called him again and I said, I am going to apply to the linguistics department. So this is this is how I switched <laughs> path and 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 pursued linguistics. And did you feel that it gave you some? You know, you talked about how you had studied. Uh, French and used French in a sort of, you know, learning context. Mm -hmm. um, and you said that you felt that you were not literate in, in Wolof. And so did you think that learning more about linguistics would, would give you a, a different perspective on, on Wolof as well? I didn't. You didn't think that? Okay. I did not. And I think the first paper that I wrote in that department was actually a comparative study between um, children's acquisition process in Italian, French, and Spanish. Okay, wow. <laughs> you know, so this was kind of a, a, a collaborative paper, but with, um, um, you know, one of my classmates. Um, I was actually going in and still work with the languages, the intellectual languages right. that I, you know, uh, um, I thought I needed to work with. You know. So at what point did you realize you could take what you know about linguistics and also apply that to Walla? Well, this came through the teaching. When I started, of course, you know this. I mean, there, there's a, there was such a paucity of resources to teach this language. There was no textbook, hardly any. There was one very old Peace Corps textbook written, I think, in the late 70s or something, um, which you couldn't get a hold of anymore. So we had, the department had some copies of that. There was no concise anything to, to resources to, to, uh, to teach Wolof. Right. So I had to develop materials. So I started writing little texts, you know, recording things. And in the process of, of, of doing that, and I'm also taking linguistics courses, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Noticing things, and also really noticing the beauty of the language, not sure. not just these interesting things that are happening with the morphology, the phonology, and 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 the syntax that are so much more interesting than <laughs> you know what I saw in the European languages that I knew. That I I felt drawn to it. I felt drawn to that, and I said to myself. This is what you need to do. You need to work on this language because also, obviously, there was some work done, but not as much work as you know you could find on French and uh, Spanish, Italian, and so on. And um, and the work yeah. that was done was it done by people who spoke that language, who spoke Wolof and came from that culture, or was it done by people from other? languages and other cultures there were a couple of things done by people who speak the language sort of the the the, the 
the more prominent people who, who, who you would find that cited in, in works were actually not people who spoke that language. And th this work done by people who did not speak the language but simply studied it or elicited it, did it match up with what you knew of the language or, or not? Did they focus on things that you felt to be unimportant or were there mistakes perhaps? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, they focused on important features of the language and some descriptions were really good. I will not take that away from them. But, I mean, you could see mistakes of analysis that came from actually not knowing the language. Right. And I remember my advisor called me and said, I don't want you to make a career out of correcting people. Oh, really? Yeah. So Because I would find things and say to him, how can they say this? Do you see this? And he said, <laughs> and he, he said to me, I am seeing a trend here that I don't like. Right. Yes. I, I don't make a career out of correcting people. Do your own study. Come up with your own analysis. And don't worry about anything else. Do the things that you're interested in. But when you find something in a source, don't make a point of addressing that mistake. Right. Mm -hmm. So you started to look at Wolof in this way. You started to see it through a linguistic perspective. Mm -hmm. And so as you have this knowledge of the language that sort of comes from different angles, what, what is it that when you impart it or teach it or tell other people about the language, how, how do you want them to look at it? I think there's kind of a big framework <laughs> within which I work. And depending on the, on the group of people, right, I want them to, to unearth certain things in the language. For example, there's this cultural concept in Wolof called teranga. And people usually translate it as hospitality. And this is also what heritage learners hear most. I mean, they, they hear teranga, they try to translate it in their mind. They, you know, they've seen their family show teranga to somebody. But they, so they say this is being hospitable. Uh huh, teranga. Right, teranga. But they never, although they have witnessed other contexts in which, you know, teranga is active, uh -huh. th they don't think of it really as teranga because these are not, those different contexts do not happen very much outside of the country. Or they, you know, they don't witness that here as much. But they have traveled home and they have witnessed something like this. So it, in, in order for me to kind of use them to make students think of um, this term teranga, because that's what I give them in the, uh, you know, in the glossary. They see hospitality. Right, but right. I say, you know, we'll, we'll talk about this. Now. Sure. Yeah. So then I say, I might ask um, them to have a task. Maybe. I tend to really pair heritage and non-heritage most of the time. And I, and I will tell to the heritage, think of all the contexts in which Taranga might apply. Okay. So, you know, um, they will maybe give me two, but they will be missing maybe three, which they have never witnessed. And I have to kind of bring that in. So when we get back, maybe they, they came, they, now they're uh, talking to the class, telling them, oh, this is what we found out. You can, you know, actually uh, uh, show Teranga in this context and in this context. And we're having a discussion. And then I, I would bring a scenario. Okay, so what if this is a naming ceremony? Yeah. How do you think Teranga would apply? Right? And that might joke their memory. They were at a naming ceremony once in Senegal and they see the things that happen. And their notion of what this might be now will lead them to find the things, that, the acts that were performed there that actually are linked to Teranga. And that Teranga is not just about, you know, giving people food and making them feel welcome in your home. So, it seems to me like you're identifying 
a hook or a, 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 a place, a, a, you know, a fixed point, mm -hmm. you know, the word teranga, that a heritage learner who maybe grew up in the United States and maybe has traveled to Senegal a handful of times in the United States, they might have heard this word applied to the context of their home, mm -hmm. and it would have given a kind of reduced view of what that is. Exactly. And to see the full spectrum of that mm -hmm. word and how it's applied, mm -hmm. you really need to be in the context in which that language is spoken. But they know that context, but only parts of it. So right. perhaps they've been to Senegal, they've attended a naming ceremony, but they might not have attended another event where that uh, word was used. Right. So really what you're doing is you're saying, okay, you have this kernel of understanding, mm -hmm. which is important. You need a place, to, you, need a, you need a foundation, mm -hmm. but then you're able to help them add to that concept. Mm -hmm. And as you are building up that and and making more robust that understanding, the L2 learners in your class are watching this process of idea fashioning happening mm -hmm. and they can be part of that as well and understand this concept not just as a word hospitality right but really as a whole set of practices a whole way of interacting with the people around you right and so in and i usually kind of going from the elementary level where you know you can only do very simple things or very targeted tasks to that, you know, um, understanding of the culture and building on um, sort of concepts. Um, right. Yeah. You get a little more complex in the levels um, above, right? And in, in uh, advance, I actually might ask them to write about Tebet. It, you know, I, and give a definition of it. What does it mean now to them? And write it in, write this in Wolof. In Wolof. Okay. So, and in one way or another, they will actually see it for what it is. Okay. It is fundamentally an art of showing humanity to the other. Okay. Really. It, it is, you know, um, yeah, it, it is... You know, the recognition, not only of the person as a person, but also a recognition of your ties within the society. So you know, what relates you to this person is also recognized in performing acts of teranga. So how does the notion of teranga differ from what we mean when we say hospitality? <laughs> Well, what we mean when we say hospitality, I think, is is much less complex. Yeah. So let's say, you know, I was passing through your town. Um, I needed a place to stay. And I call you and say, hey, Chris, can I stay at your apartment? And you say, well, sure. Actually, I'm not here. I'll leave the key, you know, um, at the reception and, you know, enjoy use, yourself. Use my place. Yeah. Use my place. Sure. That is hospitality. Yeah. You are not even there to connect <laughs> with me, right? So so what we think of hospitality here is much less complex than, than teranga. So teranga is really a more, a richer form of welcoming a person. Mm -hmm. So what, what would that entail? You know, if I were to come to your house in Senegal, how would you show me teranga? Well, first of all, food is essential. So I would probably cook special meals, make sure you eat, uh, and probably tell you to eat until <laughs> you push me away and say, get away from me, I'm done. Um, <laughs> you know, um, show you kindness, make sure you're comfortable, and you don't feel in any way that you are not in your own home. Right. Right. So as a guest, what are, what are my responsibilities as the recipient of teranga, if I have any? Uh, well, um, you should make sure you don't frustrate me and refuse any kind of acts of teranga I am showing you. What if I've, what if my, what if I had enough to eat? What if well, I can't eat Well, obviously that okay. <laughs> it is. It, it, it's a 
maybe not, you know, feeling annoyed that I'm I'm repeating. Please eat, Chris. Okay, Please okay, eat. yeah, <laughs> okay. right. So, so that because that's that's part of it, and this is something that. You know, I let my students know, though, especially those who are going study abroad. Don't get, you know, angry at people because they're forcing you to eat. It's it's, it's this practice. Right. If you you have you are full, you're full. Uh-huh. They're actually not expecting you to, you know, really overeat. But it, it is part of Taranga to show that they want you to eat. They don't want you to be shy right. and feel like you know you have to restrain yourself. From really eating to yourself. So there's a a way of like honoring another person yes. with teranga. That, exactly. That with uh, hospitality, you don't really you don't have that kind of obligation to the other person. No, no obligation of honoring the person, making them feel good about themselves, making them feel like they're valued in 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 this space. And. You know, I think it's probably really important for students to understand a concept like this when they're learning the language. Mm -hmm. Because if they were to go to Senegal or go to an area where Wolof is spoken, Mm -hmm. they would be embodied within this concept, within this idea, within this practice. So they're not just observers of it. They are part of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and Taranga doesn't allow you to be rude or... Ignore somebody because they show up at your place and they don't tell you, right? There, there's all that difference, you know. Taranga, uh, uh, yeah, does that does not also allow you to not include a person who was not expected when you're serving a meal. When you serve a meal, anybody who shows up can it's, eat. Sure, right. That th- those things need to be understood. I mean, the, the, it's completely different here. I'm not obligated to give you dinner if you show up at seven at my door, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Right, here, right. Yeah, so. And so I think this kind of goes against a common view of language learning, which is that you just learn words mm-hmm. and you use those words. Yeah. And it's kind of like Google Translate. You know, you put in the word ho- hospitality mm-hmm. and you get teranga. That's a one-to-one equivalence. Mm-hmm. But what you're describing is it's, you know, this is... This is not true. This is totally different. It's different. It's different, and and I think in in our main, mainstream language teaching, you know, we incorporate culture. I'm not saying that um, it doesn't happen because a lot of language courses uh, incorporate authentic materials, so you you get you see the culture. But I think deliberately kind of designing backward from what needs to be understood about the culture is not happening in a lot of language courses. Right. But that's what I think we do in teaching African languages. Anyway, that I that's what I believe I need to do in teaching Wolof. And I think that with a language like Wolof, you're also contending with the colonial and post-colonial context mm-hmm. and all of the ramifications that that entails. And so how does learning a language in this way um, subvert or circumvent or challenge some of the received notions about language learning when you're dealing with a language that was placed within a colonial context? Well, I am not sure that actually we should think we have a choice in doing this. I, I, I think... Any teachers of an African language should feel they don't have a choice but to look at teaching an African language as a decolonial enterprise. I I, I think that should be just it, yeah. as, as far yeah. as I'm concerned. Now, how you do it, there are many ways of doing it. Sure. So my way of doing this is designing my materials you know backward from from what i think students should know what are some of the enduring understanding they should get out of taking a wall of language and you know what are the what are sort of the questions that 
need to be asked to lead them to or that they need to actually think about, right, in order to lead them to these understandings. So that's one thing. Um, actually, right now working on a project where I, I really am thinking about how to do this progressively through levels. So some sort of vertical articulation, right? But what I do is in elementary world of where they have very little language, to kind of dig into these concepts or these questions that need to be asked and these understanding that they need to get, I give a lot in L1. So with every unit that I have, there's extensive cultural notes. Okay. I, I explain some of the things they need to know in L1. But I know that I'm going to be using this background knowledge in higher levels. Okay, so you're laying where the Where they can, I lay the foundation there, where they can actually now talk about these things in the language, right? And you're also eliciting this information from, from students who have some knowledge of the students culture. Students who have some knowledge of the culture. Yeah. Very little things you can do in, in, in the language at the elementary, but little things just like that matter. You know, making them notice when they're learning family, you know, there is a term for your maternal uncle, there's a term for your paternal aunt, but there isn't for your paternal uncle and your maternal okay, your maternal uh, aunt. They're simply your father and your mother. Ah. Uh. They don't get to talk about exactly why this is until later. So you're really planting the seeds. Yes. But but that they they notice and they and they say things I ask them to say things. Oh, uh, cultural part. In um, American culture, my uncles are just my uncles from the paternal end of it. In Senegalese culture, that is not the, you know, something that. Right. In Senegalese culture, my paternal uncle is my father. My maternal, yeah, that. Simple sentences and noticing the differences. But this is, this is laying the foundation to be able to discuss the role of these and seeing why right. these particular Relations were named specifically. What is in that term? What does it mean? They do that later. So really, you know, if we talk about it, you, you use the, the term decolonial, mm -hmm. decolonizing. Mm -hmm. So it's really through a, a tiny act of noticing that you initiate this type of process. Yes. Very tiny from elementary. And, you know, it gets deeper and deeper. Yeah. From intermediate level, I start drawing their attention to concepts that are related. Okay. You know, not noticing also. Like what? Like this act of teranga, how is it related to the concept of moon having patience, which is another one that also is, is just very complex. Very rich, yeah. Very rich and which unfortunately... You know, in, in, in the literature, in, in African studies, you see this analyzed as something that, that is used to oppress women. You know, and there's, there's so much that is ununderstood about this concept. What is that, it? Can that, you say it again? The concept of patience? Moon, moon yes, patience. It, it's, that's how they translate it. Okay. Right? It, is, it, it has a... I mean, the, the literature on gender and feminism has taken this concept and ran away with it to, to justify all kinds of claims. But the reality is they don't understand that this, this concept is deeply rooted, really, in, in the history and the culture. And it does not just concern women. You know? so, it's, so it's often described as a, a way of oppressing women. Yes, but this is a central concept to the whole philosophy of, of all of people. So what are some other resonances that word or that concept might have? Endurance, compassion. It, it, I can go on and on. It even goes to faith if you, if you go deeper and deeper. So, yeah. <laughs> so as you, as you do this, you're kind of, it seems to me you're kind of setting up an architecture, a mental architecture, uh, epistemology, a way of knowing the world mm -hmm. that differs yes. from 
a colonial way of knowing the world or a European way of knowing the world or an American way of, of knowing the world. How hard is it for people who aren't ex exposed to that previously to start to think in this way? <laughs> um, I'm not sure um, that I know how hard it is um, for them. And when you when you mean people, you mean the students. Students, right? yeah. Just, just to start thinking this way. I think, you know, because it, I'm grateful that, you know, we, we, in the language courses, we generally have our students for like, for three successive years, you yeah. know, um, if they go to the advanced level and sometimes four, if they, you know, take a, an upper level course. And I think, you know, from going from elementary, normally it may not be obvious what I'm doing, but at some point in intermediate, I do get reactions. And I start getting questions, the type that I want to hear. And I don't think sometimes they're even aware that I'm making them think uh, uh, about this. I don't disclose this. Okay. Right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I kind of insidiously <laughs> insist in <laughs> yeah, this. <yeah. laughs> uh, because, I mean, if you also talk about these things, you might scare them that oh she's trying to do something different with this. Right. i just want to learn the language yeah but you, and that yeah but i think by the time that they realize it they also realize this is a much more interesting way of learning the language yeah i'm learning so much more so what are some of the questions that intermediate students start to ask you at the intermediate level so this two family terms that i talked about sort of their motivation comes through marriage. Okay. When, 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 we, when we talk about marriage in the intermediate level, I often, I don't say anything, but I often get, oh my God, is this why the Nijai is called the Nijai? You know, the, the maternal uncle. Hmm. Yeah. So because, you know... Let's say we, we, we had, a, we watch um, a video of, of a wedding. Yeah. And they see some rituals performed by the paternal uncle. And then, you know, before that, they see that, uh, you know, the woman say, go talk to my Nijai or something. And they hear what the Nijai has to say and then, you know, how it proceeds. From. Then they're seeing, really, why these two people are specifically named that they actually have a role that they play throughout their nephews and nieces' lives and the special relationship that they have with them, right? So these, these things, and then they will, they will ask. And, you know, at this point, I can actually talk about the words. Right. You know, what they mean, right? It's not obvious to them, but... There's a root there that they know, and I could just say, so what does this in between here mean to you? Right. Uh, yeah, that's... It's kind of an extended act of noticing and making connections between different concepts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When you look more broadly at your teaching of Wolof, you know, what, what do you hope to accomplish in a, you know, in the sense of politically engaged sense, perhaps, because it sounds to me like there's a, a, a type of ethical mission that you have in your, in your language teaching. So how would you describe the ethical dimension of what you hope students will come away with as you, as you teach them over the course of several years? Well, I think I hope to see them become more open-minded, more understanding people. I hope to see them look upon the other human being as someone who is not so much different than them, but from whom they can learn so much, right? Um, yeah, I, I, I hope to make them understand that people are different, but in the end, we're all human beings. But we, we grow up in a community which has different values. All of that 
is is something to 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 gain from, not something you know you should you should look at as foreign. Right. right. It can only enrich your life if you actually open your heart and your mind and try to know these these communities. Ethically, that that is what I hope to achieve. Something related, which is targeted at PhD students. I hope to make them understand that without language, they cannot produce any kind of deep knowledge. Right. Whatever they produce will be very superficial. Yeah. yeah. I want them to understand this because language is the means through which people express their understanding of the world. Yeah. And if yeah. you don't have it. If you don't have it, what do you understand really? Right. What kind of knowledge are you producing? about these people that you aim to analyze. I, 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 as a language learner myself, I definitely agree with that and I've seen it in my own process of language learning. Do you find that this is a hard case to make in a university system like, in the, like the universities of, of the U.S.? Is it hard to make the case for the learning of an African language in the U.S. university system, or or is it not? What kinds of challenges do you encounter? It's very hard. Um, you know, I'm I'm sure you've you've heard me go on talking about all, all the frustrations. So I'm not going to talk about all of them. But uh, well, the teaching of African languages in the U.S. is is very uh, rests on very shaky grounds. Most of the time. Yeah. Most African languages that are taught in the U.S. are not located in departments, for example. We are sort of the exception here at Columbia and then a few other institutions. But generally, they are located in um, centers of African studies, which are not academic units. And in that setting, uh, most much of actually the teaching is done through graduate students. You know, these centers kind of recruit graduate students who come to do a PhD at the same time. They teach language. So this was initially, actually, all you could find, except for a few, uh, you know, uh, full-time faculty members who actually were not African themselves, but Africanists. Mm -hmm. But at that time, these Africanists were highly, highly fluent in these languages. They spent years learning these languages and they taught them themselves. You know, wherever you found them, they will be teaching whatever language they know. Then they recruit graduate students who speak other languages. And that is the way they formed sort of their African language programs. So although this faculty will be located in the department, the languages themselves will not all be located in that department where this faculty member is, but rather at the Center for African Studies, which is a non-academic unit. So, so this, is, this is the setting. Some things have changed uh, in the sense that now you have people like me who hold full-time faculty positions in different institutions. We have our African Language Teachers Association, the field has professionalized a bit, but the majority of African languages remain taught in the old context by graduate students. Right. You mentioned that in the last five years, you've had many more heritage students in your classes. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if it's possible that there may be a, a new consciousness about the value of African languages or uh, different way of structuring um, how we think about what languages should be learned at a, at a deep level within the university. Do you see any, any possibility of, of that? I think there will be more and more demand for, for these African languages as you know the heritage population grows. I think my approach of teaching this language is going to produce at least some heritage learners who are, go on to pursue high degrees maybe, or pursue their higher degrees with an approach that 
shows the value of language in the academic world, you know, and the academic enterprise anyway. But I think the major factor that plays into heritage learners learning the language, at least those who are here in America Mm -hmm. and are of Senegalese, Gambian, or Mauritanian descent, this is part of knowing themselves. It's a pursuit for understanding their identity. I think being in this racialized contest, it is important for them to speak their language to understand where they come from, to feel a connection with the people back home and also feel connected to their culture. I, I think that that is, that is the biggest factor for, for heritage learners. Now, in that process, some also connected to um, their academic journey. Right. It, it, it becomes important in the academic journey. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned that you know many of the the heritage learners, or I, I guess all of them, are individuals who find themselves in a racialized context living in the United States. Mm-hmm. And so could you talk a little bit more about why you think it's important for them to know this heritage language and, and perhaps to know it not just at, a, at an everyday level, but also the academic or the literary or the business registers of, of that language? Yeah. How does that... What does that do? What does it accomplish? I think it it makes them decide, um, uh, well, understand and then decide, you know, how they want to live here and how they want to relate to African Americans. I think at some point they realize there are neither African American and there cannot be just like black. Uh huh. You know, so so this is. It's it's very a very complex sort of identity to be born here of African descent. Some of them can neither say that they're African American nor African. Some of them choose to be African, and so th- th- this is it's difficult to come to terms with and decide how you're going to navigate this and who you are going to be in this context. There's another side to it that just doesn't apply to people of African descent, you know, whose parents are Senegalese or whatever. Diaspora people, too, and even African Americans themselves. I've had African Americans in my class who, through research in their ancestry, believe that they are linked to Senegal. Yeah. So you also do have that. There are diaspora people who are trying to understand. Uh, their blackness. Right. Right? You know, so, right. So you've had students who are 20, 21, 22 years old Mm -hmm. who have looked so far back into the past who've learned or have reason to believe that they are of Wolof-speaking origin. Mm -hmm. And this was in, was it in any way preserved through the nightmare of slavery and handed down in some form or another? Not always, but there's at least one of them who found that some linguistic expressions which could be described uh, described as part of an idiolect that his family has was recognized as coming from Wolof. And by... Studying it and taking your class, was he able to gain more knowledge to allow him to understand this this heritage, this distant heritage, and this this signal from the past better? Yes, yes. and I mean, with also me giving so much culture and all of that. Yeah. Not only that, but certain performances or 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 um, actions, simply actions or or habits yeah let's say were recognized you know like what like what kind of habit using for example a mortar to pound your spices rather than and and it didn't seem to have come because there are other cultures who who do that but you know it didn't seem to to have come from 
those cultures right. that he connected to Senegal, the use of certain spices in a certain way mm. as well, and even some some very specific acts of teranga ah. being performed. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Wow, that's yeah, that's incredible to to be able to to perform this um, act of excavation of the past, but also construction of the self in the present through language learning. Yes, it's 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 very interesting to see. Well, you know, we've covered a lot of territory. Uh, thank you for speaking <laughs> with me about this. Um, I really I really appreciate you being here and. Um, Look forward to continuing the conversation. Um, so, Professor C., thank you so much. Thank you, Chris. It was a pleasure being here and speaking with you.